Okay, good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Julie Petty and I work with Meat and Livestock Australia as the Goat Industry uh, Project Manager. We've got a really good webinar lined up for you today all around uh, some of the findings from a project we've been doing looking at the opportunities for positioning goat meat in the Australian domestic market. And I have to say the results of this work are pretty exciting and there's some pretty funky and, and different ideas that have come out of it that, um, that we'd be really pleased if, if people in the industry wanted to sort of grab by, by both hands and, and run with. So uh, what we'll do before we get into today's webinar is just run through a little bit of housekeeping um, about the webinar program itself. So there's a couple of different options in terms of connecting your audio for the webinar today and you can either do that via the phone using that toll, free, that, uh, toll number that's on your screen at the moment or you can connect your, using your computer. So if uh, you're finding one is giving you a little bit of feedback or, or something, uh, try the other option. Okay. And if you have a question at all throughout today's presentation, I'd encourage you to pop that into the chat box, um, which you should find um, in your webinar, webinar control panel. So what I might do, um, just so I know everyone's able to hear me okay and you found that chat box, if you wanted to just pop into that your postcode, um, that'll just let me know that um, I'm not just sitting here talking myself. Um, and that we've, we've got a live audience out there who are, who are um, ready and raring to go. Excellent, okay, I can see a few coming through. Thanks very much everyone. It's always terrifying with these things when you never know, um, <laughs> when you never know who you're talking to or if anyone. So um, without further ado, what we might do, David, I'm going to bring up your presentation so everyone should be able to see that on their screens at the moment. Um, David, have you, you've got the presentation up and ready to go on your screen because I'll just change things over and make you the presenter if you're ready. Yep, correct, yep. Okay, cool. So um, our speaker today is uh, David Jenkinson. David's been doing this work for us and I believe he's been talking to quite a few of the producers who we've got online today. Um, about you know some of the the feedback and whatnot that they've had when uh, dealing with some of our um, customers and consumers. So, David, I've made you the presenter, so you should be able to start sharing your screen with us, and I'll let you know when that pops up. Okay, so I click on the share screen one. Yes, please. Okay, and. Let me, is that working? Yeah, did you want to make it full screen? Uh, yeah, let me, uh, is, that, is that okay? Yep, that's come up. So um, everyone just put it into the chat function. If you're having any dramas and you can't see the presentation, let me know. But um, I can see it, David, so please kick off. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, right, I'll, I'll get straight into it. Um, I thought just quickly to cover the, um, the objectives, as Julie said, it was to really understand about what is the opportunity in the domestic Australian domestic market, particularly amongst those with um, Western food tastes, to build their demand and desire for goat meat, um, and in all its forms, and, and taking into account all the challenges that exist. So the whole project really was across these five stages, and, and when we talked back in uh, in September, we covered off the first two stages, but it was really to get the internal perspective initially. Sorry, first first up was to understand more broadly around the world, how goat meat is positioned and the role it plays in different cultures, then to get the internal view within the industry and the ambition at stage two. So then presenting today, we then wanted to talk to those end users, whether they be butchers or chefs or end users, consumers who are currently using goat meat, to get their impressions, the positives and negatives of the way they see goat meat. Then I guess the real sort of innovation or strategy part of it was to start to identify where we think the opportunities are in terms of who we should be talking to and, and particularly what meal occasions we should be targeting. And then, and then from that point, identify where we think goat meat based solutions can best fit the marketplace and, and take, um, take us forward. So I'll just cover off just very briefly the conclusions from stage one and two for those that weren't um, able to participate then was basically these key points. Firstly, goat meat is like, much as much as it's known amongst Australian consumers, it, it's largely unseen. Most consumers don't see it around. 
it's not on the menus of the restaurants they go to, um, but there is interest in it. Um, clearly, goat meat is popular around the world across many different cultures, but typically in strongly flavoured, long cooking time and, and often occasional consumption. Many of these countries that eat goat meat do actually don't eat a lot of meat generally, and so it is a fairly occasional, often celebratory thing. Um, it's fair to say the trends are definitely working in our favour towards goat meat um, coming to the fore. Consumers obviously have increasingly cosmopolitan tastes, wanting to embrace different food cultures and different, different dietary regimes, whether it's things like Mediterranean diet or Japanese sort of style food. Um, also, encouragingly, encouragingly, other what we might call secondary proteins have found ways to gain prominence with consumers. Whether it's duck or kangaroo or mussels, you know, they've all found a, a role in consumers' lives, even if it's uh, only occasionally. But I guess on the, on the sort of negative side, on the production side, there's a general sense of frustration and even say resignation amongst many in the industry, given the challenges in supply across every level of actually taking from production all the way through the marketplace to get it actually out in front of the consumers. Um, and also a sense that everything that should be tried to remedy the situation has been tried. And I guess that's the sense of frustration. Um, but as Julie sort of said to me before, it's like, just because it failed 15 years ago doesn't mean to say it would necessarily fail again today. And I think that's one of the key themes about what we've discovered now is that many of those strategies in the past may well be more successful now than they were um, 15 or so years ago. And lastly, a belief that at some level we need to distinguish the different types of goat meat offerings in the market, although that I guess was largely driven by supplier-led desire to realise you know, the premium they felt they deserved for their offering. So let me get into um, the next stages. So stage three was critically, how is goat meat seen amongst different channel partners? So we interviewed a number of different butchers um, from the very top end like Churchill's all the way down to sort of your ethnic butchers and your family butchers and, and your more premium progressive butchers. Um, we also introduced a number of chefs who are using goat meat, not only in again, ethnic restaurants, but also more sort of contemporary restaurants and a number of consumers as well, although they obviously were harder to find. So just, one page on each. Amongst butchers, a goat meat is seen as offering something a bit different, a bit exotic and a bit more interesting uh, than customers would normally consider. The implications of that is that for those what I would call more progressive butchers that looking to differentiate from the supermarkets, they quite embrace the idea of having goat meat as something that they can have that's different to what a standard supermarket might offer. They source challenges in sourcing it particularly consistency of supply and adhering to specs, you know, their required specs. Uh, we begged the question about, you know, how to best manage this perpetual issue. Um, most fully admitted they don't fully understand the contrasting qualities. Most have sort of honed in on a particular version of goat meat that, they, that works for their customers, but didn't necessarily really sort of understand the different versions or, of goat meat that exist. And so, you know, there is job for education. And lastly, the belief that goat meat should be promoted to more adventurous cooks, you know, and because there's a lot of, they say, adventurous cooks out there, people watching My Kitchen Rules and all that sort of thing. Um, and that if that, that can be coordinated with getting a push through the, the, the retail channels, then that would be the best way to sort of have an impact in the marketplace. So, so that's the perspective of the butchers. If we then go on to the chefs, and if, if you have a look at the report, you can see in more detail who the chefs actually were. But a range of contemporary chefs, I think in that illustration there, that's from the Brown Brothers um, um, restaurant at, at their winery. Um, some sort of um, uh, the illustration in the middle there is sort of like a, um, a North African sort of fusion French restaurant and obviously an Indian restaurant there. So, but we took folks to about eight different um, chefs across the spectrum. So these chefs see goat meat as a good addition to the menu, not only as an authentic offering, but as something a bit different to the usual fare. Um, and so they're, they're interested in having goat meat, um, I would say. They like working with it, and many of them talked about, you know, often they find other meats a bit boring to work with because they're pretty plain and there's not much you can do with them. So they actually quite like the idea of adding flavours and spices, um, you know, and it's an important point of difference and something that they relish um, working with. At the premium end, they struggle to, to secure consistent supply. Um, and, you know, there is this sort of sense that it has to be a special on the menu or, or at best seasonal um, as to when they believe they can, they can access it. Um, they, did, they do feel it works well on the menu, in particular in colder months, that it does, it, it's sort of full and robust flavours 
um, work well to their style or their desire in terms of the way they want to cook it. Um, and they also believe it's well suited to a restaurant menu um, because, you know, in their mind, it typically requires not only many diverse ingredients, but fairly long and attentive cooking times. So often sort of pre-marinating and long, slow cooking before finally finishing it off, which, which they tended to believe that was, you know, a challenge for consumers. Although, as, as Michael will say, I mean, that, that provides a great opportunity to value add um, the way we present goat meat to consumers ultimately. So that was the, the perception of chefs. Um, and then thirdly, if we had a look at the consumer perceptions, um, you know, generally we found that the consumers we spoke to were very interested in goat meat. And whilst they don't see it around much, when they do, they're interested in it and, you know, want to, want to explore what it's about. And, um, you know, I think that's part of this idea that most consumers or many consumers these days do want to explore foreign food cultures and embrace authentic food experiences. And they do recognise that goat meat is popular, you know, outside of Australia, and hence it's, a, it's an interesting thing to explore. Um, consumers attempting to cook with goat meat, um, you know, it's interesting if you go onto the SBS website and have a look at their recipes and, you know, the, 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 the scores that consumers give in terms of their level of satisfaction with the outcome they've got, is that it seems that most consumers generally don't rate the end result pretty well. Now, I don't think that's because they don't actually like goat meat, but it's more because they have trouble uh, overcoming some of the barriers of getting the desired result in working with goat meat, which is, you know, relating back to what the chefs talked about in terms of the stages they go through. Many do find it quite challenging to cook with goat meat. Um, so, and as I said, you know, the, if, again, the recipe is on SBS, which is where most people find reference points to cooking with goat meat. You know, they've got long ingredient lists, long cooking times, and as I said, are often frustrated with, with the outcomes. Um, sourcing from ethnic butchers or farmers markets is really the only places where they predominantly find it. Um, and, um, you know, there's not, not much indication as to what guidance they're getting in terms of the different qualities of goat meat. Most are fairly unaware. Um, you know, obviously the guys that, who sell through farmers markets do a good job of explaining what their offering is. But typically they don't fully appreciate, um, you know, the contrasting qualities of goat meat and, and, and its appropriate usage. So um, our key conclusions just from that perspective, because this, this project is very much, you know, focusing on the end users and the end users being the final connection to the consumer, predominantly being the butchers, um, although we did also talk to Woolworths as well as part of this project. Um, obviously the chefs who are using goat meat who will probably be the most tangible inspiration that consumers will have when they'll try a goat meat dish in a restaurant and get excited and want to try it for themselves or, or see it on My Kitchen Rules or something. And obviously thirdly, the consumers themselves. So these key conclusions are firstly, that we believe a better proposition for goat meat is not around the health platform. I mean, health is good, but it's probably not the reason why consumers are embracing goat meat. But it's more this idea that goat meat represents the different flavours of what the world is about. And this is obviously just a very short list of examples from Italian to sort of Indian or um, uh, North African style food or Turkish or Moroccan, you know, different styles of food that goat meat is, is, or, is or can be strongly associated with those different styles. And they represent this desirable quality of, around flavours of the world and wanting to experience some of those flavours. So I guess that's our, our first conclusion or recommendation is, is focusing on its, um, its, its cosmopolitan appeal and its flavor, it, its, um, you know, multi-culinary multi sort of um, um, access to. The second conclusion is this desire to need some sort of simple classification of goat meat. Um, this is not about being better, but rather recognizing the different qualities of different types of goat meat. Now, I'm not going to suggest, or I'm, I'm not suggesting that this is the way it be done, but, but there needs to be some sort of clear and simple approach to classifying different versions of goat meat, one that's embraced at every stage of the supply chain through to the end user, just so that, just so that consumers can get a better level of satisfaction out of using it by, being, by using it more appropriately to its, its, its designated purpose or, its, or what it's best suited for. Um, and that everyone else understands that, butchers and, and, and everyone else understands that as well. The third point, um, you know, is around, I guess, a fairly provocative thought is, would we be better off owning a season? Um, you know, the lessons from some of these other secondary proteins, particularly mussels here, 
is that they don't try and sort of suggest consumers eat mussels all year round, but they partly because of when mussels are inherently at their, at their best in terms of their eating quality, but also partly in terms of, you know, when they're best suited to the seasons, which is a more sort of summery kind of style. Um, and also not trying to, you know, not trying to put all their eggs in, sorry, having a greater focus at one time of the year, that they've done a great job at actually promoting, you know, muscle consumption um, sort of during the, the late summer months. And that we feel a similar approach would be relevant to, to goat meat. Um, as I said, primarily driven by when it's most readily available. Um, and then we can have a greater impact in the marketplace. Um, and, you know, more people, more people are liable to embrace it when they feel it's in season and at its best than really just sort of sitting in the background 12 months of the year. The fourth conclusion was, again, this idea that you know, really originated from the butchers, but I think was fairly universally um, supported, was this, this idea that you need a coordinated push and pull approach. There's no point in having it feature on My Kitchen Rules and then consumers excitedly going down to their local butcher and getting frustrated it's not available. So at some level, you know, there needs to be this coordinated effort to get it, you know, to get consumers interested, but to allow them the access to fine goat meat and, and you know, the, the, the help and assistance they need to then work with it because, you know, consumers will pretty quickly move on if, if, if when they go and, find, go and look for it, it's not there. There'll be something the next week or two weeks later that appears on my kitchen rules that will capture their interest. So, you know, we, we have to make sure that we do have this coordinated push and pull approach to getting it out there, um, which I believe was was you know talking to people was what was done many years ago. Um, so I recognise that that's not a new conclusion. And then lastly, and you know what we'll move on to after this is a recommendation to focus on consumer segments. Um, you know, different consumers have very different food behaviours these days. We don't all sort of cook the same meals, whatever. You know, we've got very diverse behaviours. And even within that, you know, what people do on a Friday night is very different to what they do on a Monday, Tuesday night for a whole bunch of different reasons. So we've got to be far more focused in terms of where we, um, uh, you know, where we look to um, target goat meat and who we target it for. And certainly recognise the distinctive qualities of goat meat mean we're better off focusing on a particular group of consumers to ensure they're effectively converted you know, through, through goat meat's value adding properties and, you know, devising um, different meal solutions, rather than just believing we can blanket target everybody and think we're going to convert them. So I might just flick over to, to the next, um, the beginning of the next section, but really put it open to any questions at this point around, around those key conclusions and hand over to Julie to, uh, to facilitate that. Thanks very much, David. Um, so guys, if you have any questions at all, um, please pop those into the chat function. I can um, get those through to David uh, as they come in. Um, I'd be interested in, in people's comments or um, I guess gut, first gut reaction in terms of uh, the idea of owning a season. Um, it's something um, muscles do particularly well by the looks of things and it certainly um, perhaps is an option in terms of um, incorporating into the GOAT messaging um, to people around the seasonality and the availability of product. Um, so it perhaps wouldn't be the only, um, I suppose, apple in our barrow, but it, but it might be part of the messaging. Um, I'd be interested in people's um, response or feelings to that or, you know, and if we were to pursue that, what is that season, do you think, um, that best aligns with both with supply and with quality? Um, so, um, David, we're just waiting. I can see a couple of people are sort of just busily typing in some questions they've thought of. Um, is, so we might just hang 10 for a little bit. Um, in terms of the muscle, um, the muscle idea is that, how long has that been running? They, they do, did you want to elaborate on that a little bit while we're just waiting for people? I mean, that's, that's some kind yeah, that's, of... Yeah, I mean, that's, that's local chief I know quite well, but I believe there's a number around the country. It's been running in Melbourne yeah. for about uh, six or seven years now and, um, yeah. you know, gets a fair degree of visibility and notoriety. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, believe me, everyone loves muscles when it comes around. It's not the sort of thing that I think most consumers would stick with 
once they've had it two or three times, it's pretty limited what you can actually do with muscles, but they make a real event out of it. And it's a real experience for people. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it really does raise it, the approach. Yeah, it's incorporated with some sort of jazz or blues festival, isn't it? Like they make it a real festivity, yeah. don't they? Yeah. Yeah. We, we were something, um, so we did a presentation to uh, some North Queensland goat producers a couple of months ago, um, and given their, I suppose, somewhat regionally removed from other suppliers to the industry, it was something we were discussing as perhaps uh, having sort of a, a, some kind of goat festival or event showcasing North Queensland product. Um, so there's definitely, I guess, the point of the project is that we're trying to look at a few different options that might suit um, different purposes. Um, well, David, I, um, I haven't had any additional questions come through. Um, so I might just... Oh, sorry, hang on. Uh, here they all come. <laughs> um, <laughs> So there's a couple of comments coming through about um, a winter goat curry week in the June long weekend, perhaps, as an idea. Um, there's, uh, there's something called a goat October in October in certain parts of the world. So maybe we could maybe we could tie that in with Oktoberfest with beer or something, perhaps. I don't know. Um, yeah, so I guess um, while we're just waiting, we might, um, if you wanted to continue on with the presentation, David, and um, everyone, um, at, once we've finished, um, David sort of talks through some of these results and whatnot. We've got another presenter who's David Lee, who, um, not David Lee, Michael Lee, sorry, Michael, who uh, works with uh, Meat and Livestock Australia and the MLA donor company. And he and I are going to be talking through some different funding opportunities that are available uh, should any of the producers um, who are listening in tonight wish to pursue any anything they've sort of heard tonight that sparks their interest. But um, David, I'll hand back to you, if that's the right thing. Yep, great. Thank you very much. Okay, so, so to that last point, you know, around we, we believe key to, to sort of getting success in the marketplace is to focus on different consumer segments. Um, That's really what we then sort of pursued. So I'm just going to go first up though, the key strategy around this is we need to make sure that whatever we do with goat meat, we're playing to our strengths, but also recognizing there's a number of inherent barriers to usage. And so anything we do needs to sort of address both of those. So hopefully you can read through those strengths there. Then There's no great surprise. It is a healthier red meat. It's always an interesting alternative. And that's, I think, one of the key things. You know, there's many weird and wacky things out there, like consumers eating locusts or whatever else, but consumers want to take a safe step out of what they currently know, and goat meat is that. You know, it's sort of familiar, but it's sort of a bit exploratory and alternative. So that, that places it in a really great space. It is rich and full-flavoured. Um, you know, that's inherent qualities. It has character and depth of flavour. It's something that, you know, the chefs talked a lot about. Often it is or can be locally sourced, which is a very positive thing. It does embrace this whole idea about cultural diversity. Like if you if you had a, a festival of all the different countries that do use goat meat and put them together, you would almost have the United Nations there. So it does definitely embrace that cultural diversity theme. And it does take skill and effort to cook, but that does justify the reward. And that's, I guess, an important point. It's not like chicken, which is very quick and easy. Um, it does take a lot of effort, but the effort does justify the reward, which is, again, why a lot of the chefs like it. On the barrier side, it's not, they're not really negatives. They're just challenges in using it in terms of getting the best out of it. Obviously, one is it can be a bit gamey, which is a challenge to the taste of many people. It does require long and slow cooking, although obviously with the advent of different cooking technologies, that, that need not be a, an issue. Um, the feral associations, you know, I mean, I didn't come across that a lot, but some people in the industry believe that's still the case. Um, this idea about it has inconsistent qualities. You know, I think that is a challenge that it is quite variable. And so you do find like a lot of chefs being very specific about, you know, carcass weights or ages or whatever else in terms of what they're requiring to try and overcome some of these things. It does take a lot of cooking. Um, you know, this idea, it often take, requires many stages like chefs sous vide it before they then or marinating it and sous vide it and then, you know, pan cooking it, whatever else can be a barrier. And, it, and obviously it is fairly inaccessible. It's not easy to find it around and not easy, not, it's generally not consistently available. So those are the strengths and the barriers we're working to. I guess what's good about that is it's not, it's got good strengths and it's got some important, it's got some significant barriers, but that's something we can work with 
to find a place in the world for goat meat if we look out there in the world, as long as we're smart about where we look and where we think it can apply um, in the world. So the process we went through is let's have a look at what we think are relevant target consumers, what might be a relevant meal occasion, let's identify what we think is a goat meat based solution that could be a good fit, and then let's also think about how we might be a bit more innovative around developing a meal solution to overcome some of those barriers. Now hopefully all that will make more sense when we go through an example. So these were the consumer segments we looked at, and we'll focus on three of those. Young families, I believe that's always been a real focus to get younger consumers embracing goat meat and to grow up with it. Adventurous cooks, um, I mean the chefs, sorry, the, the butchers very much identified those as being the leading, you know, the innovative leaders in terms of um, shaping new trends. New age foodies, um, you know, many of those are interested in flexitarian, you know, kind of ideas, sort of giving up meat or cutting down on meat. The baby boomer generation have got a real health focus, and we'll talk about those, as well as professional couples who've got busy working lives. So um, the report that uh, has been produced goes into far more detail and talks to all five of those. I'll just go through three of those now just to give people a general idea of, of what we think is uh, an opportunity for goat meat. So talking specifically to young families, this is, you know, what we're trying to do here is just identify a core audience, understand their world, their approach to cooking, and what's going to fit with, the, you know, their approach to cooking. And then, as I said, identify what form of goat meat could work quite well. So this first one, we focus more on the white collar families, um, particularly with younger age children, probably more realistically, the, work, the better educated and, and the ones with more discretionary income are probably the ones most likely going to be interested in it. Um, but not exclusively. Now, their desire is to do the right thing by their kids, establish healthy habits, you know, they try and cook a meal for their kids. It's not always possible. They have to balance practicality, you know, with health and enjoyment. So different meals on different days tend to lean more towards convenient solutions versus making a bit more of an effort to not to get a spaghetti bolognese or something. So, you know, section three, for them, a real favorite is things like meatballs. You know, mum would certainly know how to make meatballs for herself, but it's probably not got the time to cook them from scratch, you know. But in terms of meatballs as a, as a format or a form for goat meat, you know, it certainly promotes this idea of healthier red meat. Certainly meatballs, you know, as being small little pieces, you know, full and rich flavour is, is a positive. And certainly the idea of being locally sourced would be a big positive for mum. So, you know, rather than making them for minced meat, um, and just this example here, I think, is from an organic beef brand here. You know, there's, there, this is not revolutionary, but the idea about, you know, goat meat meatballs, you know, could be a, a flavoursome and healthy alternative to pork or beef, you know, that potentially the whole family can enjoy. Because, you know, one thing we found is that, um, you know, dad doesn't really like, you know, a lot of the pork or beef meatballs, you know, they don't necessarily deliver on the meatiness side for him. Um, and, you know, mum hates having to cook two separate meals. Um, the other insight was that mums often believe that these, you know, that these meatballs often contain a lot of excess fat and they have to sort of cook them, cook the fat out of them before they can sort of, um, you know, get on with it. So, you know, I guess the great thing about this format is it can overcome some of the challenges of long cooking times because small meatballs don't need, you know, made with, made with mince don't need a lot of cooking overcome some of the inconsistency issues, doesn't require complex cooking because all meatballs basically cook the same. And I guess, you know, as a format, it would generally work well for supermarkets and that sort of thing. And I think if you have a look at Kangaroo and what, what, what from their line sell well, I think it's more the, the meatball type offerings more than the loins that actually sell pretty well through Coles and Woolies um, would, would potentially make a more accessible, you know, mass solution um, to, to get it out there. So, you know, Michael and I, Michael was very keen that we sort of put, put a bit more tangible numbers to some of this. So we sort of had a go. So this is, this is to be debated. But roughly, we think if we look at 30% of those younger families being the sort of the more white collar ones, that represents 630,000 households. Typically, they would, they would sort of have this, you know, a couple of nights a week, Tuesday, Wednesday night. Typically, they, they'd make the effort to cook, typically spend about $8 per meal on the kids, represents an overall value opportunity or overall prize of funds in 25 million. So, you know, we, we believe that goat meat has got pretty positive properties here. So we should get a reasonable amount of trial and, you know, a moderate level of, of repeat or ongoing usage at 15% would represent about a $16 million opportunity for a 200 gram portion size with a total sales volume of 400 tons per annum if that was all sort of uh, multiplied up. 
Um, and again, I mean, Michael will talk more to this, but the great thing about a value adding format of this is that meatballs typically command between 20 to 50% premium for basic mints, even though there's obviously very little difference other than they've been made up into little meatballs. So, um, you know, that, that enables um, the whole of the, the value supply chain to embrace this more readily than just trying to sell a more commodity type offering. So that was the first opportunity space we identified. I'll, I'll go through the other two a bit, bit more quickly. Hopefully you've got the idea of them. Obviously adventurous cooks, um, you know, the people who regularly watch My Kitchen Rules, who aspire to be like that, for whom the weekend is all about, you know, um, having a go at replicating some of these things, sourcing the ingredients, cooking for friends, you know, they, they aspire to be like the master chefs and the MKRs, you know. So for them, the great thing about goat meat, you put the effort in, you get a great reward. The full and rich flavors, just like the chefs, embracing cultural diversity and locally sourced are all big positives. And so we're proposing something like a goat meat tagine, you know, is, is all about, you know, with, with maybe a range lamb or Chevron, whatever style with real spices, is a great way for them to sort of get into or satisfy their desire for more adventurous cooking. And it would overcome whatever challenges there might be around gamey flavors, inconsistencies, you know, accessibility is overcome because they'll go and search it out. So there's a whole lot of, you know, if they, if they can be encouraged to cook it in that way, that would overcome some of those negatives. And again, working through some of the numbers, hopefully we've been pretty conservative. I believe My Kitchen Rules and MKR at least get a million viewers a week, you know, when the finals are on 2 million viewers. So if we said there's 250,000 of these adventurous cooks, hopefully that's been conservative. Probably once a week, they only do their adventurous cooking, maybe on the weekend. They probably spend a bit more, $20 per meal at least. So that's an overall prize if you multiply it out of $260 million. We believe that given goat meat's interesting properties, we probably get a pretty high level of trial, 30%. Again, maybe being a bit conservative here, 10% share of ongoing occasions. Hopefully once they've tried goat meat for a Moroccan tagine, they might explore other sort of ethnic cultures with it. So that represents an $8 million opportunity. And again, probably a larger portion size here, 600 grams, a total sales bond of 235 tons. Um, now the scope of value adding here is a bit different because I guess the parallel we're using here is it's this group here that transformed um, lamb shanks from being something you give the dog to being a very desirable sort of cut, you know, that can be cooked long and slow and rich flavors and whatever else. So the opportunity here is probably for some of these less value cuts can be, you know, greater appreciation can be, um, can be realized from that. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's an in interesting thing that Undoubtedly, the adventurous cooks are the ones that tend to start the trends in terms of other consumers embracing these sorts of ingredients. So they're important for us to target. But whether, can, whether you, you guys think there's other opportunities with other types of goat meat based dishes to reach them and, and opportunities to value add with them. Um, you know, I think, unfortunately, the value add is often in the equipment they buy, like that beautiful tagine there, necessarily as much as the ingredients as well. And then the third opportunity, I think is important one is the baby boomers. Um, you know, and this, this perhaps plays to the health platform. You know, their mindset is finally free of kids. They focus, they focus shifts back onto themselves in their autumn years and want to get health and enjoyment, you know. So they're out and about hiking, whatever else, but they don't want to cut back on enjoying red wine. Someone said it was good for them. Um, you know, uh, I think the key insight here is that they find being, being healthy in the summer quite easy because they can have salads and they can, you know, steam salmon and that kind of stuff. But in the winter, being healthy is much harder. And a lot of them complain about putting weight on and, you know, it's, it's not easy, easy to embrace. So we think that, you know, goat meat can play a good role, particularly a loin of goat meat, you know, with, with subtle, you know, spices and root vegetables and whatever else, you know, in those sort of winter months as a, as a healthier red meat, full and rich flavors, again, a bit of cultural diversity and locally sourced can all, can all work there. In terms of a value-adding approach, you know, this is, this is learning from... Um, those expert chefs about the way they do it. And a lot of their customers are this audience as well. You know, you think about some of those wineries in the sort of the regional areas that they would visit on weekends is that, you know, they suit Vida these things. And they say it, it, it really does, you know, bring out the flavor, make it far more tender, you know, and they pan fry it afterwards. So if, if there was a solution that could pre, be pre sous vide, that would overcome some of these challenges about long cooking times, complex cooking processes and those sorts of things. So um, the number around that, well, there's an awful lot of baby boomers out there. You know, uh, if, even if we just did 25% of households, that's still a huge number. Um, and they spend a fair bit. 
per meal, and, and they do it a couple of times a week, um, try and have a healthy, healthy meal. But if we, if we sort of, you know, again, being a bit conservative, they are, they are hard to shift. They are generally a bit more set in their ways, although they have, as we said, converted to salmon. Um, maybe estimate 15% trial and an ongoing 15% share of occasion for those that do trial. Realise it's a $26 million opportunity, which again, you know, they all talk about a, a portion size of the palm of their hands, I guess is about 150, 175 grams each, 250 grams per meal for two, is 450 tonnes. And again, if we look at, say, a solution that I love, which is that Peking duck um, version there, those which are sort of pre-cooked that need sort of microwaving or heating up at the end, um, you know, solutions, they typically command at least 100% markup on the basic product. So, um, you know, hopefully that represents a, an opportunity to, uh, um, you know, to target that audience and to add value to them. So that's, that's pretty much it from me. Hopefully that gives you a taste as to, you know, this idea that we think there's opportunity to focus on different audiences to develop these solutions and to think about value adding to them as a way to sort of, you know, play to the strengths of goat meat, the, you know, the undoubted, you know, great strengths of goat meat, but also overcome some of those barriers to its usage. Um, and all, hopefully also in a way that, you know, in, in value adding is actually creating opportunities for producers, but also other people through the whole value chain or the supply chain that more, you know, that everyone can embrace it and, and be a part of its success. Over to you, Julie. Thanks very much, David. That was fantastic. I'm, I'm pretty excited. Um, so guys, if you have any questions at all for David, please just um, start popping those into the chat box. Um, while we're just waiting for that, um, uh, David, did you just want to go back to that, just make that the full slide again, if you could, please? Um, that last one? For yeah. The, yeah, so I was just going to say, I don't know if some of our the guys listening in today have seen the um, the Love a Duck products in their local supermarket, but next time you're in there having a look around, go and um, check out those. Because I think, I think we were discussing those, David, that that brand has completely transformed um, the way duck is um, I suppose interacting with with, action, with the consumer directly, and that those sort of semi-prepared meals are retailing for twenty dollars a piece. Yeah, it's twenty dollars right? for for three hundred and fifty grams of, of duck legs, basically. So um, yeah. yeah, and they've they've, they've done um, I guess you know they've they've made something that was sort of a little bit out there, like it's similar to chicken but different. Um, and made it much more accessible, and it's no longer something you would just have. You know, you might try that at the um, the restaurant or something, because you wouldn't have a clue what to do with it at home. So they've they've completely changed, transformed that space. Hmm. Anyway, um, I, I suppose personally, I see that as maybe a bit of an opportunity for Go. If we can if we can um, tackle some of those issues, like what's on the um, the uh, SBS. Um, website with the recipes there with 400 ingredients and make that a lot simpler and have it pre-marinated and pre-spiced and whatever um, and taking some of those, you know, some of the thinking out of the equation for goat, maybe that's potentially an opportunity. Um, okay, so David, um, while we're just waiting, um, I haven't seen any other questions come through, so I think we've, we've stunned everyone perhaps a little bit. Um, <laughs> That's not a bad thing. Um, um, Michael, Lee, um, are you online and are you ready to start your presentation? Michael? I'm unmuted. Good Michael? evening, everybody. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you now, Michael. Sorry, I'm just bringing up your presentation. Hang on one second. And I'm going to share my screen. My screen. Okay. Um, everyone, you should now see um, on your screen Michael's presentation, which is that, um, that you have a slide. So just let me just pop it into the chat function if you if you have any dramas or anything like that. But um, Otherwise, Michael, I think we're ready to go with you. Yeah, so good evening, everybody. Thanks thanks for the opportunity to talk about the MLA donor company. So this is um, part of a subsidiary of MLA where we can co-fund 
um, with brand owners and producers. And as we heard from David, certainly we're excited with some opportunities in, in goat meat. Um, so the MDC program, for those that haven't uh, participated before, is where we, I suppose, essentially we're keen to experiment and help companies um, who want to do research and development and look at some market research opportunities. So building on some of the opportunity spaces David mentioned, you know, there might be some interest where you want to look at goat meat um, for the family or goat meat when those occasions, you know, we might be an event similar to the mussels um, event that we, we heard about. And what we can do at MLA is we can look at co-funding that opportunity dollar for dollar. So in, you'll see in the slides some examples um, that I've given. And we've basically got three main programs that we can offer. And the first one we call a partnership project where essentially we, we can match dollar for dollar. So you might want and, and need some help with some chefs or some um, product samplings and shelf life trials. Uh, they might need to be go out and, and do interviews with customers and talk to either shop owners or restaurants. And those types of costs, both for your time as well as if you do need to bring in some third party um, providers or you need to cover the cost of your meat, those things are all qualified for research and development and we can match that dollar for dollar. Uh, we've got a second program which is um, specifically targeted for producers mm -hmm. and it's known as our Producer Innovation Fast Track Program. So this is a program that um, we started this year and we've actually got a submission period um, it's quite short. It it's closes on the 1st of January and that, that program, as I mentioned, is targeted um, for producers and we offer additional funding support. So, for example, if if we had a $40,000 project with someone, instead of being $20,000, $20,000, this one here would be $10,000 for cash from the producer and $30,000 from from MLA. Um, what we, I suppose, that program is extremely competitive, but at the moment we have no GOAT um, initiatives in that program, so I'd love to see a, a GOAT producer um, get involved there. Um, and our third program we have is something called I plus E Connect. And that's where we're actually working with startup companies and entrepreneurs. And so um, we've been looking at MLA, how producers, particularly in America and, and Israel, how those types of producers are interacting with entrepreneurs and startups. And I suppose doing things differently. Um, so examples I saw in America recently was how does a startup work with a producer at a farmer's market? So they went nowhere near supermarkets um, and they looked at online shopping, basically different disruptive business models. And uh, so again, that's something we can, we can work with those that are interested in seeing what that looks like. So I suppose in summary, um, you know, I was extremely excited by what David showed. Um, would love to work in a customised one-on-one project with um, with producers and we can have a chat about um, individually what that would look like. Uh, quite often we, we certainly have our standard terms and conditions but in terms of ownership of recipes, um, owning you know the details of the customer, all that remains commercial in confidence. Um, what we would look for would be um, a case study to talk about you know what surprised you, what did you find and perhaps some photos of of your products that you, you did would be, um, I suppose, our, our anticipated um, final report. So happy, again, to have a conversation with Julie um, and, and others to sort of talk about what that could look like. Cool. Thank you very much, Michael. And um, if it's all right with you, I might share your presentation as PDF with um, all of our listeners, um, just because it um, I actually stuffed up and wasn't scrolling through at the right speed for you because um, <laughs> I couldn't work out where we were. Um, but um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of opportunity here um, to, to do some more work in the GOAT space and work with producers specifically to pursue you know, something that you're, you're particularly interested in um, within, um, within some of these different funding frameworks. So. Um, we might pause if, if it's all right with you at the moment, Michael, just to um, see if we have um, any questions that have 
through um, from people. Sorry, I will just put that down. Julie, the sorry, Julie. Maybe just before I go, I might just add one last thing. Um, MLA chef Sam Burke, who, who many, many of our producers may know, uh, he's going to do some work in January where he's going to build on some of those ideas that David's presented. And um, so we'll keep everyone abreast of abreast right. of that. But uh, oh, he's keen to bring to life those dishes. Um, sorry, I might just ask some. Someone might just have accidentally been unmuted. If you might just, if you would be able to mute yourself, that'd be great. Except for you, Michael and David. Um, I guess the other thing too, just to let everyone know, is that we are also working on producing a series of um, videos targeting the food se sector, looking at different methods um, and tips, I guess, in terms of how you might use both rangelands and farmed goat meat, looking at a bit of a carcass breakdown as well, and just talking through some of the usages and cooking methods and whatnot. So. Um, we'll be circulating that out to everyone and should anyone have their own sort of website or, or Facebook um, profile for their for their goat um, related business, no problems whatsoever if you wanted to sort of share that content um, with perhaps with some of your customers and, and whatnot. That's no drama at all. Um, so I um, might just do a bit of a check in on some of the questions that are coming through from people. Um, so one of the questions, um, okay, so, um, so the question to just saying that there is another funding opportunity as well through something called the MLA um, Collaborative Marketing Program as well, if you've got a branded um, goat product. Uh, that's effectively looking more specifically at, at, at marketing um, different opportunities, whether that might be different things like um, looking at package development or um, your participation in a, a food service trade show or something like that. Uh, I can certainly, what I'll do is I'll circulate to everyone after the webinar some information on that program as well. So um, we've got a range of different um, funding me mechanisms available for a range of different things. Um, so we've got a few people coming through saying they're really interested. That's fantastic. What we'd like to do after the webinar is um, perhaps uh, do, a, I guess, a one-on-one -on -one conversation about your your idea, your concept, uh, and how you like what you like to pursue. Um, there's a question coming through around: Is there opportunity to uh, do incorporate some sort of carcass grading system in some of these projects um, to help improve consistency? And, and certainly, that's an issue across the industry. Um, so potentially, I, I think that might be something we can look through uh, as well. Sorry, I'm just scrolling through looking at um, more of the questions. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, so there's no more specific questions coming through for, um, for Michael and David. Um, there's a few different ideas coming through that we might address with those people specifically if that's all right with everyone. Um, so from here, um, I will circulate uh, Michael's presentation and David. Um, presentation if that's fine with both of you guys um, to all of our attendees just so you've got that um, got those links and whatnot to just have a read through um, and before we started the webinar tonight I circulated some information about the producer fast track um, program specifically a bit more detailed info there so you can definitely have a look at that um, and what we can do from here is um, just get that information out to everyone for you to digest and, and have a think about um, and see where we go to from here. But we're very, very interested in getting some uh, goat specific work up and running um, following David's project here um, so we we don't sort of languish with this, with this new intelligence and we make the most of it. So, um, so David and Michael, um, Thank you so much for your uh, time in presenting today. Um, 
I just had one further question um, in terms of, you now this one's for you, David. Uh, in terms of the interview what you did with um, Chef Food Service and, and Consumers, what's your initial opinion on a change of name in terms of uh, making a difference in consumption? And I think this is in relation to farms versus rangeland and, and what the consumer thinks either of those mean. Um, and I reckon that's potentially a very good project to further look into. But David, any initial comments there? Um, yeah, I guess um, I guess for me the most I would say most consumers don't know that there is that those two versions exist. Um, and so what what you all choose to call it is is less of the issue. It's more the commitment that you decide that you actually want to delineate between them. And that you know, the, whoever owns each, whoever sort of is part of whichever side, feels good about the name. So I mean, I, I tend to think Rangeland is a great name personally. Um, the farmed one, I think, you know, again, it's sort of it's, it's it's that clear and simple. So, you know, the name I would say is pretty good, but I think it's it's the commitment to follow through and make sure that that's understood throughout the marketplace is for me the greatest challenge. Yep, fair point. Okay, cool. Um, well. We might wrap it up there. Thank you so much everyone for your time and joining us tonight. Um, the webinar is being recorded so we'll have that recording up on the website as soon as we can. Um, you're very welcome to forward that around to anyone else who you think might be interested or come back and watch it later um, just to I suppose refresh yourself on anything. But thank you so much again. Um, we really do appreciate your time um, and your interest in this. And Thanks again to David and Michael. And everyone, I hope you have a fantastic Christmas. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye.